Good morning, friends, and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Hey, thanks for joining me today. We're getting started in the book of Revelation, laying a lot of groundwork. I know this is going to take some time, but if we're going to do this right, this is how we've got to do it. Join me in chapter one. Grab a good cup of coffee and let's talk again about not only this book, but some of the foundations of it that actually we may find in other places. And today we're going to talk about the primary number of the book of Revelation, and that's the number seven. Now we started as as we began with the authorship of John being acknowledged twice already in the very first paragraph. He begins verse four by saying, John, to the seven churches in Asia, wow, there's our first seven mentioned, grace and peace to you from the one who is, the one who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Why couldn't there be five spirits, 10 spirits? How about 150 spirits? No, there are seven spirits, he says, before the throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests unto his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever Amen. And thus, this glory and dominion of God is recognized immediately by the author John. But already we've had something appear that you're going to find consistent throughout this last book of the Bible, and that's the use of the number seven. It's no accident for those of you who haven't had a chance to see it. My little short video on the amazing first verse of the Bible, which by the way is nothing new, it's stuff that's been borrowed from all kinds of other authors down through the years demonstrates how this number was imprinted right on the very first verse multiple times and that the chances of that being somehow engineered and happening just by accident, it's impossible. There had to be a definite divinity. There had to be a creator with an intelligent design working on this book to make all these things come to pass. And to do that over so many centuries through so many different authors and 66 separate books is beyond amazing. That's why this book we call the Bible stands out against every other book ever created in all of human history. There's never been anything like it. There never will be anything like it from now on. So as we look at it, this number seven pops up all over the place. Now, I won't go into as much depth as the late Dr. W.A. Criswell did when he preached two entire sermons on just numbers in the Bible to lay the groundwork for Revelation. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what he did. That would take me about two weeks and wake up in the Word at minimum to cover that kind of ground. So I'm not going to do all of that, but I do want to give you some of what he said about this number seven. He says, look how the number seven was put together. And you can see how it came to symbolize the fullness and the perfection of God's word. The perfect world number we said was four, four points on a compass, four winds, four directions, all, all the things that are represented by four, okay? That represents the world, he says. The perfect divine number is three. Yes, the number of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So together, these two numbers make the holy and sacred number seven. Seven is the earth crowned with heaven, the union of heaven and earth. Four and three, the creature manifesting the great creator. Seven days make up each of the four quarters of the moon, thus the week originated. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then you start all over again. How many times a month? Four times. Seven notes make all of our music. God's world, God's universe, God's book are musical with the numerical imprint. There are seven fundamental notes in music, and the eighth is but the beginning of the series again, the beginning of the higher octave. The sacredness of that number seven reaches back to the very beginning of all time in creation. The seventh day was hallowed by the Lord after the works of creation, after the creative work of God. The number seven speaks of fullness, of completeness, of accomplishment, and 
of rest. Now, Criswell notes that as far back as we can tell in human history, other people have noted this. He talks about Pythagoras and others who, as they looked at creation and they looked at mathematics, they could not miss this use of the number seven. It was just imprinted all over creation. And thus, we have throughout Scripture another common use of the number seven. In particular, as you look at it, it's found historically, it's found literally, it is found in the rituals that God had laid out for his people. This mystery of seven is found all over the place. Well, what happens when we come to the book of Revelation? Well, we find it to be a book of seven sevens, at least. And when it's, it's referring to these seven churches, for example, we're not to think that this means Oh, this is only for the seven churches of that day in the first century in this little area of Asia Minor we would call Western Turkey today. No, it's for them. It's their message. No, it's a complete message given to all churches of all time in all ages. That's why the number seven is there. Jesus talks about being Lord over those churches, those seven, and that he stands in the midst of those. That doesn't mean he was just standing in the middle of those churches in the first century and he no longer stands with us. No, the, the complete opposite is true. This book of Revelation is laying down for us a principle that it is Jesus Christ who is Lord of the church and he stands in the middle of them even today. And when he speaks these messages to the seven churches, he's speaking to us and our churches today as much as he was to all the churches of the, the entire realm of Christianity in the first century all the way down to our day. There is no division there. It is Jesus Christ who stands as Lord in the midst of those seven churches it is him who loves us, it is said, who has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us this kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It is that same Lord who said, now I'm going away, but my Holy Spirit is coming back to be with you, and I will never leave you nor forsake you, and I'll be with you to the end of the age. So what was he pointing to? What John is writing about in this book, what's been given to him by the Lord of those candlesticks, those lampstands, those churches, of saying how this age will end, how it will all come to pass. And because there are different viewpoints on the book of Revelation, you're going to find some people who have the idea that Oh, these are only things that happened in the first century and they're over and done with and you don't even need to read this book anymore. To those who say, well, you know, these are events that happened down through history, but it's not really about stuff that's going to happen at the end. Then there are those who say, no, it's only about the end and something that's going to happen, a little capsule of either three and a half or seven years right before Jesus returns. And then there are those who say, wait a minute, you need to look at the big picture here. There may be a beautiful portrait here of all of history right up until the personal glorious return of Jesus Christ being put on display for us to see so that all the churches of all the ages until Jesus returns can find encouragement and inspiration from this book for the day in which they live. And in that hint, you understand exactly what I believe about the book of Revelation. We're going to get more into it tomorrow. Join us each and every day, and I hope I'll be able to give you some things that'll help you understand as you read this magnificent book that completes our Bible. You have a great day in the Lord. I'll see you again right here tomorrow as we wake up in God's Word.